Today on Sister to Sister, we're talking about should you be unequally yoked. Do you know what that is? Oh, I know about that. I actually have an experience with it. Uh-oh. Yeah. Yikes. And what about man buns? Hot or not? I don't even know what that is. Oh. I really don't. And here's a question. Do you like me? Of course I like you. Yeah. Aww. Stay tuned. We like you. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Sister to Sister. If you have just tuned in, look, five opinionated, strong, godly women. Roxanne, our attorney who turned judge, is in Harrisburg getting sworn in. Yay. 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 And we're so excited we have Sydney Grant Yay. sitting in. Hi. Hello, welcome to the house. Yeah. You know, uh, a few weeks ago, we talked about being unequally yoked and it was hot topic, you loved it. So I'm gonna go there again, and here's why. I wanna know, should a pastor marry an unequally yoked couple in their church, and what do you do or say to your child if they're dating someone who is not the same faith? Can I jump in on, yeah. the, on mm -hmm. the pastors? Because we have this all the time, where couples come to our church, they want us to marry them, and sometimes we know them, sometimes we don't, a lot of times we don't. So years and years ago, we made the decision we can't get married, you know, at this certain church because I was divorced and blah, blah, blah. And we thought, how about instead of just saying no right up front, we take this opportunity to invest in this couple's life, share with them the gospel, see where they're at, and at least help them because here's the deal. They're going to leave our church and they're going to go somewhere to somebody who's going to marry them, whether it's the justice of peace or wherever. And so we take this time through 10 to 12 marriage classes and we minister the gospel we talk about finances we talk about being equally yoked and we have seen so many especially guys give their lives to Christ oh, in that marriage training oh, so we looked at it a little bit different instead of just saying no right away you're unequally yoked we took the opportunity to invest in the couple see where they're at and help them along their journey yeah but what do you think Sid you're You've experienced this. Yeah, so I went through premarital counseling um, about a year or so ago, and, and the pastor that um, that we were going through the like classes was the same thing. It was like um, different sessions with finances. They talked about sex. I mean, they mm -hmm. just were real about marriage. But one thing he was very big on and he's, he's like, I want to marry two Christians, two people that love the Lord. And I even, it um, reminds me of the verses like, you know, how can two walk in the same, in the direction, right. you know, if they don't agree. And that's really something that's big on my heart. And even in my walk now, you know, since that relationship has passed that I've realized that even if you're a Christian doesn't necessarily mean that you're that's on the right. same page, oh, right. you know, you can't, like, yeah. I think a lot of times it's, you know, it's not yeah. just like unbeliever and believer, but also Christians. Like I, for me, I know I can't be with somebody who's lukewarm or not all in, or, you know what right. I mean? I'm not trying to drag him. That's because you are exactly. so all in girl. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. What do you have, Corey? Um, well, along the same lines, I think that it goes back to even further before that. I mean, I think in the mindset of like my kids and teenagers and dating, I think that you need to set the precedent with your kids when you're outlining guidelines for dating. Like, even at that point, saying, don't be unequally yoked when you're dating. You know, don't be spending all this time with people that aren't sharing the same values as you. Right, right. And um, I think that same thing can happen where it's like, oh, well, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get them saved, I'm gonna bring them to church, you know, that kind of thing. It's like, fine, bring them to church, but you're not dating. Like but if you're watching, <laughs> if you're watching and you have this situation in your family, I want you to know that for 35 years, my husband and I were on different planes, yeah. well, <laughs> different, Planes. And George gave his life to the Amen. Lord. And so it is never too late. Amen. And a wife on her knees is always an effective prayer. That's what do you right. have, Flo? Right. Well, you know, a saved spouse sanctifieth um, the other spouse. Amen. So my, my question, though, for, for the viewers as well, is that when you and your husband got married, were you both saved? No. So, I wasn't saved. So it wasn't, oh, a, okay, okay. Yeah, so it wasn't okay. a situation of being unequally yoked. We were even yoked. Yoked. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, but um, definitely, I, I just think there's no need to be redundant. Right. I think everything was right. covered really okay. well. Good girl. Yeah. I do see a lot of young adult, though, like girls especially, they just fall for these guys. Yeah. They're like, you're so hot. You're <laughs> awesome. And they're like, ah. 
and they just like lose it, their faith. And I've seen them literally get pulled away from church, pulled yeah, away from yeah. the things of God. Yeah, yeah. I see so, that too, because it's yeah. like that'll fade away. Don't even like, date. Yeah. yeah. Oh wow, this this conversation could be a whole entire yeah. show. Yeah. <laughs> because we, and we know that you care about that too. And we appreciate you watching us and hearing our point of view. But speaking of a point of view, I love a gentleman, right? <laughs> so in this age and day of an independent woman, which we are, do you believe gentlemanly traditions are lost? And can, our audience is shaking their head, can we have the best of both worlds? I don't think that they're lost. And um, I did take a look at the article. I will say that I thought in the article he was a little um, <laughs> unbalanced. And, um, but I do think that, um, you like know. stand when a woman comes in the okay, room. Well, tell what article we're talking about. That. Did what you are we talking about? We he had an said, article that we read. He, when a woman comes to the room to the table, you stand up. A gentleman would stand up. <gasps> you know, pull so out the chair, romantic. open doors. So that. Oh, that's so wonderful. What was wonderful. the thing you used to say about like a man will live up to the expe expectation that you give them? Or you used to say something like that. I don't know, but that sounds good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I, I actually feel bad for guys this day and age because. Mm -hmm. It's like they don't know what to do. Like a woman can get offended if you hold the door open for them or they can be offended if you don't hold the door open for them. So I do kind of feel bad for guys because it's, it's a tough, you know, this day and age is tough. Some women get offended by a man really? standing up. Oh, Some don't. Wow. I, no, I really. think a lady, if a lady's a lady, that is not offensive in any level. Uh, it's not offensive to me, but there are women that don't appreciate that they feel belittled by that and so I feel oh bad for men God. I feel bad for men to try to wow. navigate what is the right thing to do but what's Sydney interesting is... in, in how he wrote it up was he was did, he did great comparisons you know and gave you some understanding as to where the tradition originated right. and how it is manifested now how right. it's taking place now yeah. well, I feel like with my generation mm -hmm. so I feel like I I I'm blessed that I have experienced gentlemanly tradition. What is tradition. your generation? Clarify. Oh, the millennial. So I guess okay, it's like the younger <laughs> than us generation. But I yeah. think so too. It's like, and um, it's just, I feel like as a woman though, that there's certain standards you need to uphold. Like I feel like right. if you, like if a guy is dating you or courting you, I've seen that. But if it's just all about one thing, it, you know what I mean? And well, first of all, you like, said courting you, which isn't necessarily a millennial term. So no. that means you were raised well. You know I about courting. Jesus taught me a lot about courting Amen. because I, I, I guess like in my experiences when I was you know kind of out in the world and dating guys like they wouldn't open the doors no. for me they wouldn't walk on the same side of the street you, you know like to mm -hmm. protect it but it's like I'm really grateful that God put mm -hmm. certain men in my life that would say hey Sydney like when we're walking down the street you know <coughs> I'm on the outside and remember yeah. that's what a man's supposed to do for your open doors and, and that yeah kind of and thing. I'm grateful my husband's the same way I mean he pulls mm -hmm. a chair out for me we're in a restaurant he opens the door for me and my son is seeing that and my yeah. daughters right. are seeing right. that right. and they're seeing he's seeing how should I treat a woman my daughters right. are seeing how should a man treat a woman and I think that's key, Corey, that the, the, the men are taught by other men in their lives, right. yes. you know. Mm -hmm. And so for me coming up, it was the fathers and the uncles and, and they taught us what to expect from a man. And once that is ingrained in you, it is yeah. like innate. Like you come to the house and toot the horn, uh, I didn't order a taxi. Me? Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, right. you, I, if I'm coming out to the, the car and you go and you get in the driver's side, I'm still standing on the passenger side <laughs> and waiting for you to come around and open the door. And I even do it with my sons because sometimes just out of familiarity, yeah. you know, my son may be picking me up and it's like, okay, and you know, I'll stand at that wait. passenger door until yeah. he comes around. Oh, yes, I love because that. I'm raising a husband. Yeah. I'm raising a husband. Yeah. Yeah. When, when, uh, I'm out with my boys and they hold the doors open for people, ladies, oh, men, okay. women, all, all kinds. And you would mm -hmm. not believe the amount of comments that come flooding right, in. And they're doing boys. it naturally oh. because that's what dad taught right, them. Yeah. And, and speaking of what dad mm -hmm. taught them and little boys, <laughs> what is a man bun? And do you like them, not like them? Well, I went into deep prayer when I read this one. <laughs> Cause I love our producer, but I thought, what happened was she hitting the eggnog over the holidays? <laughs> Why are we about to talk about body parts? But now, yeah. now somebody else can explain what it is. <laughs> so a man bun is a male ponytail. Like your hair. 
But there, there's just no, a little it's a small. Bun. It's a bun, so it's like yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's like it's a new like a fashion trend, I guess, that's going on with guys. And yeah. I, you know, I, like when I was recently in California, um, I saw there was a lot of man buns everywhere. They had them shaved on the side, man bun on top. They had different yeah. colors. I think it's kind of cute. Oh it's a cool. Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> well, I am not a millennial. I mean, then. the guy has to have the coolness factor, right. though. I mean, if you're like a, a not cool guy, I would, I would not try the man <laughs> bun. There's a certain essence you have to carry with the full man bun. And we have a lot of man buns in our church. Well, I think you have to have a lot of so confidence. We, it's like a woman <laughs> wearing a hat. You know, girls that wear well, hats. Well, before the <laughs> bun, there was the <laughs> ponytail. My father used to, you know, yeah. he would wear his hair in a ponytail. I, I always my, thought it was When I met my husband in college, he had the, like, shaved underneath, like, the skater do, mm -hmm. and then it was, yeah. like, he had the little ponytail. He played soccer, so he had it put back. No, my husband. Did I say my dad? You said your dad. Oh, yeah. Freudian slip there. Oh, okay. My husband. Oh, okay, well, I don't know about you. I don't know if you know man buns, like man buns, like colored hair, <laughs> have ever been to California. <laughs> if you have the cool factor, if you swag, I have no idea. <laughs> but I know this. Jesus loves you Amen. very, very Amen. much. And we are sister to sister. We'll see you right after this. <laughs> Welcome back to Sister to Sister. You've joined Lively Conversation, right? If you missed the man bun question, <laughs> rewind your DVD. Okay, it was really good. But here is something I think you're going to find a little meat to it. A recent article in Relevant Magazine said that we should stop waiting for the church to feed us, right? First, what does that mean and do you agree? Well, I think you need to define, when you say, I'm not being fed at a church, I think you need to define what that is. I mean, truly, is that church not preaching the word of God, you know, preaching something against the word of God or just preaching fluff? Or are your own agendas and desires not being fulfilled? And I think that's the difference. And I think a lot of people kind of use that as an excuse, like, oh, I'm not, I'm not being fed, you know, because my style of worship isn't being used or you know, this particular Whatever. ministry yeah. isn't being, you know, put up on a pedestal. Right. And so I think sometimes that's used as an excuse, kind of like, oh, I'm not being fed. Oh, I yeah. hate when people say that. Yeah. Yeah, oh, well, I was gonna say, like, um, for me, I really feel like with feeding, it's like I think sometimes we rely too much on pastors. Like, you're supposed to go and you're supposed to hear the word, but I think it's really important as Christians that you need to read your word. You need to get in your secret place. You need to develop a personal relationship with Christ. And so sometimes I think with my generation, you know, it's like, oh, it has to be really cool worship or it has to be this and be that. It's like, but what does your relationship with God look like? And if there is a point you're feeling kind of like a wilderness, a dry spot, because I went through this recently, mm -hmm. where it's just like God was telling me, be like Moses, get out of the camp and you know go seek me go you know and I would ask God show me your glory and he would show up so oh I like he shows up and, yeah. and God does give churches and shepherds to feed the flock of God there sure. is an element of that but then the, if you're just getting fed at church you're getting one little snack a week right. and you can't live on one little snack a week that's your launching pad that's right. where the body comes together and is a powerful force but that is not for your daily use just like a baby a new babe in Christ you might go to church and that might be your feeding for a while but then you start to grow up and you start yeah. feeding yourself and getting in your own word and growing if you really want to grow as a believer you have to get in the word Amen. yes yes well, I like that you know when I read the article he sounded uh, a little angry to me and a little out of balance, um, but he had some very good points. And one of his points that the perspective he was coming from is that don't just, a little more like how Pastor was saying, don't just come to be fed, but come to equip. But he made a little comment in there about, um, you know, you you come, you get e equipped, don't, it really, it was, it, I kind of took away from it, it was almost like don't expect to be fed, right. expect to be equipped. But in order for me to be equipped, you must feed me because I must grow the, the muscle. I must grow what I need. I need strength to be able to walk this mm -hmm. thing out. And, you know, if you are going to be a shepherd after God's own heart, I mean, 
Jesus was an example. He taught, he fed, and you, we must de de desire the <clears throat> sincere milk of the word because yeah. strong meat are for those more mature believers. I can't mature if I am not eating. Um, right, I think true. sometimes <laughs> in church, as uh, Sydney alluded to, that when you reduce church to the theater, that everybody becomes right. a performer. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I don't know that I completely agree with the article, though I think there were some very good things in there. Um, and he made some very valid points. But, you know, as Jesus said to Peter, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. sheep right. So it is necessary right. for you to feed your sheep so that they can grow and develop to the point where they will study on their own. They don't know that if you have ever been around a child that is, or anybody that is uh, starving, you know, there are, you automatically don't have an appetite lots of times, you know? Because so, they're starving. You so know, you feel that. well, no, I mean the person that's starving. I'm sorry. Oh, Thank oh, you for, okay. for correcting that. The person that's starving because, you know, but the more you eat, the more of an appetite that you begin that, to right. develop. You know yeah. what I'm saying? That's why like when you're, you're fasting, it can get easier yeah. after a certain amount of days because your system adjusts to it, right. you know? Right. So it, it is imperative because I think a lot of churches have become social clubs, you know, pushing away yeah. from let. The being fed. Right. And I love, I really love what Corey said in the very beginning that people use that as an excuse. Oh, I'm not being fed. And then yeah. Sydney jumped on that. Well, feed yourself. Mm -hmm. So that, that's where I'm going to yeah. be. Yeah. Feed yourself. Open the book. Mm -hmm. Open right. the book. It's the mm -hmm. word of God and right. it's the blueprint. Have a healthy you diet. Need, yeah. Yeah. A healthy diet. diet. That's, yes. that's church. What? Fellowship. Yes. yes. You, know, good one. you good need one. both. You need good one. Well, this next question makes me laugh. Um, because I do care, but should you care? Should we care what others think about us? And this could be in the church, out of the mm -hmm. church. Mm -hmm. I care, I hope you like me. <laughs> I, think that the, I think that the closer a relationship you have with someone, the more you should care because they know you and they see you and they spend time with you. So mm -hmm. if they're seeing something or they're pointing something out, then yeah, you should care because they're the people that are feeding into your life, you but know? I care too much, Corey. I, I, no, I mean, I made I, a joke of that, but I do care too much, and that makes me an extreme people pleaser. Right. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be that, so I don't really care if you like I me. I used to struggle with that, like, too, just being, um, recent, like, just a people pleaser, and it wasn't until that I had a revelation of Christ in me that I'm like, honestly, like, I know who I am. I really don't care. Like, this is who I, you know what I mean? This right. is it. You like it or not. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of times, even I think especially with social media, it's like, how many likes do I have? You know, somebody comes commenting on this, it's just trying to feed that right. into, you know. And it's good to learn that young because it took me a lot of years to learn that one. Yeah. I would say too that we should be more consumed about what God thinks about us yeah. than we should with what others think about us. But the truth is, is that we do care what people think about us. That's why right. we take the time to get ready in the morning and that's why we're working out. That's why we're trying to look good because right. we do care. Right, we but do. that's why we have to watch as Christians too, uh, Pastor, because, you know, like as you just said, we need to be more consumed with what God, God thinks says, about us. Right. But when yeah. you are part of my godly counsel, mm -hmm. you understand what I'm saying? And when mm -hmm. you come across to me critically, uh -huh and yeah. you come across to me in a negative manner, it affects me because, you know, you are a representation of God in my life. Mm -hmm. And I, I do think that we need to watch, not to the point of it being a burden, but as Corey said, you know, yes, when there are people that are in your life that mean you well, and if they are sharing something with you that maybe needs addressed, mm -hmm. it's worth you pondering. Ooh. And I think Ooh, the problem ponder. is, is we often, we get, we get the balance wrong where we care more about the, the Facebook likes and the people we don't even know. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we, we kind of brush off the godly counsel or those mm -hmm. that are close to us. It's mm -hmm. like, I'm, ca I'm caring more about these people I don't even know that right. are giving me these, you know, social media likes than our spouse <laughs> or well, know you. and there's yes. an element too that we yeah. want to reach the loss we want to reach right. people so there needs to be some am i connecting with them on any level or do i need to change something about right. myself right. do i care well i i do care i care about each of you deeply but mostly i care about you and here's the last question i have for our show today it's so important first peter says above all else love each other deeply for love covers a multitude of sins and it does what does this mean and have you seen this work in your life oh my gosh, yes. 
I mean, I just automatically went to the love chapter in the Bible, which is 1 Corinthians 13, which has this list of things that love is. And the one thing that kind of like jumps out in my mind all the time is love keeps no record of wrongs. And I think we get into these habits of record keeping, whether it be with our spouse or our friends, where we're always kind of keeping a tabs or a scale of like, well, they did this and they didn't do this. They forgot my birthday, whatever, big, little, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. True love keeps no record of wrong. And I am reminded of that so often, especially when it comes to my spouse, when we're disagreeing about something, I have to remember that love keeps no record of wrongs. That's really hard. Well, it's that's really what Jesus hard. said when, with the woman caught in the very act of adultery. He said, woman, you know, where are your accusers? You know, you're forgiven. Now go mm -hmm. and sin no more. And so love there. But here's the thing. We're not Jesus. No. We're not God. He is pure love. God that's is love. love. And you know what? We, we, cannot operate in that love that is like a savior love where we can wash right. away a multitude. It's Jesus that covers a multitude of sins. And we, through our love, we help cover up those sins in people's lives. We bring out and pull out the righteousness in people. Oh, I love that, Amy. I love that. Thank you. Sydney. So I feel like for me recently, I've, I guess I've been ha going on this whole like spiritual journey with myself, just going deeper with God. And I think when I think about God's love, it's just so overwhelming and I think when you have that revelation of that and when you experience and encounter God's love it is so right. life-changing that I feel like right. it, you know in those moments when you're on your knees and you're like Jesus Jesus you know you love me you died for me it's like you never you don't want to sin anymore you know right. Jesus says like go right. and sin no more it's like and, you don't want, you're so and you convicted. can't make anybody else feel that too right. that's no. something you have to know you're that's right. something inside right. Flo I need you <laughs> I'm so busy listening to what everybody else has to say, you know, but one of the things that I think about in this scripture is dealing with the individual yourself, like dealing with me, love covering a multitude of sins. How does that affect me? Because it protects me from walking in offenses. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, you know, there are so many times that, you know, as we go through life, things happen and we all, you know, we all have that recording button in our mind that you hit and it rewinds. And when you see that person again, you kind of rehearse and, you know, but to walk in forgiveness can only be done by the grace of God. You need his grace, his enabling power. And, you know, the scripture tells us to do it from a pure heart. And we need the, the purification via the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. you know. And, you know, so many times I hear people, and we can make this sound so mystical, you know, talking about the love of God. But the thing of it is, is to have that thing, the engrafted word, so in your heart, and to be able to let that word be a mirror to you and see what it is that is taking place in us that hinders us from operating in forgiveness in love, so that right. we can move forward in the love of God. Right, right, and I think that we've all said this, that the abundance of love that comes only through knowing Jesus Christ is the way that we can then spread that love and that love covers the multitude of sins. We can forgive. We can ask repentance. Mm -hmm. And we hope that you enjoy the words that come out of our hearts. And we want you to know there's a number at the bottom of the screen. See it? We're there. 24-7, there's someone that will pick up that phone and pray with you and pray that you experience the love that we're talking about. We're going to wrap it up. Here at Sister to Sister, we always end the program with a scripture as a word of encouragement. And today's word comes from Isaiah 12, 2, and it says, Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord, he is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Sisters, it's so important to know that God is our deliverer. He's our salvation. Yes. He sings songs of deliverance over us. And through him, we don't have to be afraid. He always encourages us.
I love that. Good job. Yes. Yeah, Sydney Grant <laughs> on Sister to Sister today. And we have another scripture, and it goes like this. As iron sharpens iron, so does the countenance of one sister sharpen the other. And that means that these girls make me a much better Kathy. And do not have fear. Have faith. We'll see you next time, Sister to Sister.